Uh, my name is Knut Andreas Meyer, and I'm from Chalmers University. Uh, this work has been conducted together with my supervisors, uh, Johan Alström and Magnus Ek. So before I go into my outline, I would like to focus a bit on the large plastic shear strains. Um, I think most of you are familiar with this. Uh, if you look at the nominal rail profile here and compare it to a worn one, we see quite a lot of uh, profile change. Of course, a lot of this is due to wear, but also some are due to plastic deformations, which is in particular visible down here. These plastic deformations can also be seen in the microstructure, of course, of the material, where we can see these typical shear, li uh, shear lines, which this is just a regular optical micrograph. An interesting part there is noticing the size of this region. It's only 0.2 millimeters uh, in depth where most of the action is happening. And of course, this will cause some troubles if we want to test this region. So that's going to be the start of the outline. How? How can we test the material properties of this surface layer? The second is, what does this experiment tell us? And finally, where do we go from here? Maybe as an initiation to the panel discussion afterwards. So let's start with how. Because we need to produce these large shear strains that we have in the top surface of the rail. But as I said, it's not that easy that we can just take it out of the rail because due to the large gradients we have, we can't really just take out the test specimen and then test it in many directions. We might be able to test in one direction but as many of you know, that's not sufficient in order to know how the material behaves. So our solution is to look at regular cylindrical test bars of R260 steel. And then we put them in our biaxial testing machine. Uh, we start with ramping our axial load. So we put compressive load on the sample. Then we start to rotate. Uh, right now, when I have an extensometer on, uh, unfortunately, these only have a limited range, so we can only have them on for the initial part. This allows us to get the elastic constants, basically, of the material. But once we've removed it, we can continue rotating our test bar. Uh, at this point, we uh, would just check that it doesn't fail by looking at the torque if it decreases. Uh, it won't fail for this first part. Our machine can only do 90 degree increments. Uh, that's why we will soon stop this test. You'll see it in a minute here. And you'll see the elastic unloading. And then we just release the grip, rotate back the uh, anvils. I'm sorry about the text here. I'm not sure it's something happened to you with a new PowerPoint version. We regrip the specimen, and then we start this procedure over. So we can do this several times. And due to the compressive load, this allows us to put larger deformations on. Uh, you can see here that on a deformed sample illustrated on the right side here with these lines that were put on before the uh, deformation, that it's quite severe deformations on the surface. You see also the strain values there, the shear strain gamma and the axial and um, uh, what to say, the circumferential strain values. Here are some graphs that basically just shows the mechanical response. So here we have the elongation for different nominal axial loads. So you see here, this is a minus 500 megapascal, so it's a compressive load. We get a quite l lot of shortening here, roughly seven millimeters. You also notice that we can twist a lot more if we apply compressive load. And of course, the torque responses are different as well. There are some differences. These are some old results where we used a 10 millimeter specimen. Uh, now we're using a 14 millimeter specimen and also 600 megapascal of axial stress. The thicker specimen allows a higher stress before buckling and also makes further testing easier. The previous work we did then, we did the modeling. Can we model this pre-deformation? And the answer is pretty much yes. It's possible to model quite accurately 
the pre-deformation itself. We also did an experiment uh, work where we tried to characterize the microstructure we obtained from these experiments. And the question we wanted to answer is, is this microstructure representative of the field samples that we can put up of a real rail? And the answer was also, yes, it's possible up to some extent. We weren't able to get the last uh, 50 micrometers of the surface layer because that has so high deformations that we cannot really get there. But from around 0.1 millimeters depth, that, that seems representable by this method. But now we want to see how is the yield surface influenced by these deformations. And in order to do that, we cannot use the solid test bars anymore. Because obviously trying to tor put torsion on solid test bars, then it's very hard to identify when the material is yielding. Because then you get a gradual yielding as you get further and further into the material. So we had an increase of the diameter uh, with this circumferential strain you saw earlier which allows us to actually return the outside of our specimen and gets to the same diameter of 14 millimeters. Then we drill the inside using a gun drill in order to get a straight and very accurate hole. And that allows us to get these thin walled samples. Uh, so we use 12 millimeter inside and 14 outside, which gives a wall thickness of one millimeter. Uh, so it's according to the tubular uh, standard for torsion um, lo uh, low cycle fatigue testing, it's considered thin walled. So then we want to determine the yield surface. And we will do this for different amounts of pre deformation. Uh, so we'll denote that with the PD. So we have PD0, meaning no pre deformation. And then we have PD1, which means one 90 degree imp increment, three 90 degree increments, and six 90 degree increments. And you also see how the shear strain and the different strain values here differ. We use strain control loading, which is a bit unconventional when you do uh, yield surface measurements. But the reason is it gives much more stability and control in the experiments. So we think this improves the reliability of our results. So we will take different load angles here, uh, denoted alpha, where we have the uh, gamma or shear strain on the horizontal axis and the axial strain on the vertical axis. And we will use the von Mises uh, effective shear strain as our um, effective strain as our indicator for yield. So it's an offset strain. Uh, and I should say it's 0.1%. So it's quite big for yield surface measurements, but smaller than the regular RP point. 0.02, which many report as the yield limit for materials. So, what are our results? Initially, we have the yield surface here, which is very close to a von Mises yield. Uh, as we add more deformation, we see here that we get an uh, elliptic shape. Uh, at least we can fit an ellipse quite accurately to it. And you also see that it doesn't change very much when we go from only one uh, 90 degree increment to three. So we see most evolution initially, but we do see a some increase in size. If we do more, actually the problem here is that the rotation is a bit uncertain, it looks like on the ellipse. Uh, so we can say we still see an increase in size, but there is some uncertainty about the rotation of this yield surface. It's a bit dangerous, I would say now, to just jump ahead and look at, say, okay, these are the results. So I want to look a bit more careful now into what are the actual uh, stress-strain responses that lie behind this yield surface. So basically between each of these uh, points here, there is one half of these curves. They're just the loading curve. And we choose an offset strain that in this case puts us here. So if we compare this curve, which is in pure shear, to the different load levels, you see that there is in the positive shear direction, which is the same direction as the pre-deformation, there's very little change in the curves. On the other hand, on the other side, it's a much more, more bigger change. It is also a much softer transition after the first deformation, 
which is well known from typically cyclic plasticity, where you see that the first cycle often differs a lot from the following cycles. You also see that there's very similar for even the large shear strain here. But the choice of offset strain, you know, if you look very carefully, it might be hard to see here. Actually, here the red curve is the upper curve, if we look really in the beginning, and then it changes up here. So what you choose as your offset strain value would have a big influence on how this yield surface would look. And that, of course, becomes a problem when you're going to model later. And that comes to where to do next. What yield criteria can we use to predict these yield surfaces? And can we predict the evolution? Because it's nice that we can characterize at one point in history. But if we want to be able to model the life of a rail, we would like to be able to model the evolution of this yield surface during the service loading. And of course, what choice of offset strain should we use if we want to look at yield surfaces? Because the model uh, doesn't always fit best if you put the actual yield limit. You might want to have a bit larger than the yield limit. What is the correct one? And can we then get these models that can actually predict the full service life? So to sum up, uh, we have a method for obtaining field-like properties in these test bars. And we have performed some investigation now on the anisotropy of this uh, deformed R260 rail steel. And we see that this anisotropy, as I said, it develops very quickly. Already out of after the first uh, 90 degree increment, we had a quite pronounced anisotropy. This tells us that most of the railhead that has been subjected to deformation is actually anisotropic. And it's not often that this is accounted for when we do modeling of it. And finally, that just tells us there is a lot more work to be done on the constitutive modeling of the wheel, uh, of the rail surface. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and please have any questions.